my experience, you can't always rely on fish to come to you. You've got to go to them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there are fish o's with big boats, and there are fish o's with little boats. And safety is a big concern for all of them. G'day. My name's Kay Bush, better known as Bushy, even to my mum. And I've been in and out of boats for years. And what I do know is that boating accidents can happen to anyone at any time. So stick with me, we're gonna do a little bit of fishing and we're gonna go through some safety tips that are gonna keep you out of trouble. And for good measure, there'll also be a few hot tips from Andrew E.T. Eddinghausen. Woohoo, that's not a bad start. <laughs> good brim. We're gonna eat well tonight. Sports fishing is almost all reliant on having a good vessel that can take you and your mates to where the game fish are. And the first requirement, apart from a handful of seasick tablets, is your life jacket. There are only a few situations when you and your mates aren't obliged to wear a life jacket. Life jackets definitely can be a lifesaver, and that's why if you're in any doubt at all, you should put one on. Also, each state and territory has different regulations. You must be aware of those and abide by them at all times. Your life jacket is your best friend when boating. Look how small and light some of them are, and these days you can buy a new one for less than it costs you to fill up your car. A bargain, however you look at it. If you're not sure about which life jacket, Type 1 covers all situations. A good skipper plans an offshore trip, makes sure the boat is up to it, checks the weather and ensures all safety gear is on board and working. If you're going more than two miles offshore, you need a marine radio and a 406 emergency beacon. You should tell a responsible person where you're going and when you expect to return. I'm to log in. I'm heading offshore uh, out to Browns Mountain. That can be done by using your marine radio to log on with the coastal radio network. Remember, plan, prepare and log on. And don't forget to log off when you're safely back in shore. I recommend the use of a marine radio, both for the safety aspects and it's also great to check the weather and you can use it for navigational information as well. Now, you're a long way from home and sure, you've got your boating licence and years of experience behind you, but what about your mates? If something happens to you, will they be right to get the boat safely back? Morning guys, welcome aboard Spindrift. Why not take them through the basics of handling the boat and navigating safely? This is good insurance. Show them the start-up and operating procedure. What about using the radio? And mooring and anchoring? You'll need help with these anyway. Now, if you're planning a major offshore trip, it's a good idea to have an extra boat or two with you. That just gives you some good backup in case of a breakdown or worse. Anchoring can cause a lot of headaches, sometimes even tragic accidents. So for a start, let's see where to anchor from, and that's easy, always from the bow. That is, never drop the anchor from the stern of the boat, only from the bow, and always let out a minimum of three times the depth of water in anchor line. As to where you drop the anchor, no-go places include bomb borers and shallow reefs and banks. These leave you exposed to waves, currents and tides which could capsize the boat. And watch out for underwater cables. Sensitive habitats such as seagrass areas should also be avoided. If you spoil a marine habitat, there will not be any fish left to go chasing. 
Now, retrieving your anchor. There's a good reason why you don't tie off the anchor to the stern. If the anchor's stuck on the bottom and you try to pull it up by motoring away, the back of the boat will get pulled down and water will flood in, either trapping people in the cabin or sinking the boat. To avoid your anchor getting stuck in the first place, make sure you've got the right one for your boat and for the conditions. Most trailable boats don't require massive anchors, that's a fact, and having lightish picks mean the prongs can be straightened with a good pull if the pick gets stuck. Also, try wrapping the bottom chain in a sling to stop links from getting tangled. Note the electrical tie here. If your anchor gets caught, tie off the anchor rope to the bow bollard and move the boat slightly and the cable tie will snap. This allows the anchor to be withdrawn backwards so the prongs are ineffective. A final tip for boats 5 metres and over is to use a float or danboy on the anchor line. This float saves you hauling up a heavy anchor and it lets the boat do all the work and there's no chance of the stern being pulled down. Good skippers and crew wear the right clothes for the conditions so they don't get cold and risk exposure. But when you're getting dressed, ask yourself, could I swim in this gear if I had to? If you're not sure, wear a life jacket. It's a lifesaver and can also keep you warm. And remember, don't wear waders in a boat. If you have to swim, waders make it near impossible. Crossing an ocean bar can be dicey and you really have to be on your game. One of the most important things is even before you get in the boat, if it's possible, get close to the bar and have a good look at it. That way you know whether the tide's going in and out, you can see the conditions and then make up your mind whether you're going to try and get out or not. No two are alike, so know what you're getting into. Big boat, small brain, that's what it comes down to. Now, which way around and over the bar does the water flow? Watch the water carefully before attempting the crossing and chart your course. Look for the deeper channel and stick to that. Is the tide coming up or going out? If it's already low on a run out tide, leave it till later. You don't want a repeat episode of the Poseidon adventure like those blokes experienced. The best time when you're coming in or out is always around high tide. If you don't know the area well, talk to someone who does at the local tackle shop or even better, the local fishing club. Here's where you can find the clubs. Before crossing, stow all loose items and close and seal hatches. And crucially, get your life jackets on, and that means everyone. It's the law when you're crossing a bar. Now before you get to the bar, always stop and have a really good look before you proceed. If you have any doubts at all, you can come back later and have another look. I know before I ever crossed a bar myself, I had a pretty good apprenticeship by going with other people who were experienced and I really recommend this to anyone who's starting off. Fishing's not just about tinnies and game boats. There are the simple pleasures of fishing from kayaks and canoes, and we must give those fishers respect as well. But it also pays if you're driving those small craft, learn some of the rules and regulations just to keep yourself safe. 
This is an instance where size and speed does matter. A powerboat's weight can easily overturn these little vessels, so slow down when there's any traffic of any kind. Even with other boats the same size, excessive weight from speeding can be hazardous. At the same time, you fishers in small paddle vessels should take extra care even in slightly difficult conditions. You need to be experienced in handling and reading conditions and what to do if you capsize. Visibility is crucial here because these crafts sit so low. Wear high-vis clothing, install one of these inexpensive poles and flags and try to avoid busy waters. At night, make sure you've got good lights to show others where you are. Stay bright at night. There's a boat for just about everyone, from canoes and tinnies to yachts and luxury cruisers. But every boat has its limits and no matter what sort of boat you're heading out on, make sure it's suitable for the conditions. Take time to understand the limits of your boat. Check the weather forecast before you go and ask yourself, can the boat handle it? If in doubt, don't go out. Fishing at night definitely has its rewards, but we all know the risks, and every year brings another story of a horrific boating accident that could have been avoided. Now you don't want to light your boat up like a footy stadium, but good high-vis lights will keep other boats from running over the top of you. There's your green starboard and red port navigation lights, and between them you need a 360 degree white light at least a metre above the boat. A lot of people neglect the white light, but a stiff $250 fine order help you remember. And do check your lights are working properly before going out. At night, even if no other boats are around, go slowly, especially if conditions are bad. Just going back to the traffic rules, if another power boat is heading towards you, you veer to the right and stay to the right. The other boat will do the same and this is the general rule, right is right. If your boat's crossing another boat's course, the boat on the right has the right of way. Outside clearly marked speed zones, the only safe speed is where your boat can stop in time to avoid any sudden danger. This depends on visibility, other boats, navigation hazards, weather and water conditions, and the manoeuvrability of your boat. Many of our busiest waterways now have navigational markers to guide you across rivers, lakes, harbours and estuaries. Make sure you know them. This book has all the rules, plus they're online, so there's no excuse for not keeping up to date with them. And always make sure you have the right maps. Finally, how many fish hose can you fit on a boat? As many as the boat allows within its safe carrying capacity. Check your boat's safety label or builder's plate and play it safe. And make sure you keep the boat balanced by spreading crew and cargo evenly. For many boaters, catching up with family and friends is what it's all about. But don't go overboard. A lot of people already feel a bit wobbly if they're not used to being on a boat. Mix in a few drinks and the effects of sun, wind, waves and alcohol can be a lethal mix. If you're the skipper, you're responsible. So for the safety of everyone on board, go easy on the drink and keep it under 0.05. Knowing the weather is so important, 
and you don't want this becoming this while you're out there. This is a classic example of heightened risk. Between TV, newspapers, radios, smartphones and good old word of mouth, there's no reason not to inform yourself. Make sure you know how to read a weather chart. For example, what does a low pressure trough mean for your morning's fishing? The wind's offshore, but turning onshore and gusting up to 45 kilometres an hour. Plan your trip to suit the weather conditions and please tell someone about your boating plans. Now, your boat. Look after it and it'll look after you. Before you head out, check the oil and fuel. Smell around for petrol loaders and check the battery, the ropes, the bilge pumps and the anchor. And one little tip, when you're fueling your boat up, do it just before you go to sea. Go to the servo, take no notice whatsoever of your gauge, it could be faulty. Fill that tank absolutely till it spills over, then you know when you get to sea you are full of fuel. And here's a few other things you can't leave behind. A compass, an updated paper chart, a fire extinguisher, a bucket and a rope depending on your boat. A whistle, an air horn, a waterproof torch, flares, first aid kit, tool kit, and of course, emergency water and food. Lastly, think about other water users such as swimmers or divers. Keep a close lookout for their floats and flags, especially at dawn and dusk. And remember to hang on to your rubbish. Bag it to keep it out of the wind and take it back to shore with you. And that includes cans and bottles, loose line, and of course, your bait bags. I guess life's pretty good when the biggest decision you have is whether to fry your fish or stick them on a barbie. Me, I prefer a hassle-free boating life. And if you follow those few tips I've been telling you about, I reckon you'll be pretty sweet.